Hello everyone, it's Takuya here, and welcome back to the History of Everything podcast YouTube channel. And on today's episode, as you can probably guess here, uh, we're going to be talking about American stuff, specifically American interventionism, because that's not going to be a spicy topic at all now, is it? No, it, it, it definitely is. It, it definitely is going to be spicy. Now, over the years, the United States has been involved in a lot of different operations, both in the form of military operations and CIA operations, and basically everything that you can possibly think of for intervening in other countries' affairs, which is very different from what it was like when America was first founded, because at that point, America was a very isolationist state. Not to say that they didn't involve themselves in other countries, they certainly did. It just wasn't to the same degree that you were going to see after World War II and the rise of the Cold War. The unfortunate reality of that is that the more things that you tend to get yourself involved in, the more chances that there are for something to go horribly wrong. And in the Cold War, that was, um, that, that was definitely something that happened a lot. Which is the exact thing that we're going to be talking about today. Three times that U.S. intervention went, um, wrong, to say the least. Some of you probably already know these, some of you do not. Either way, I hope that you like the video and comment to show some love for this channel and help it grow in the algorithm. Well, let's go ahead and begin. Now, one of the interesting things to take note of is that decolonization and the spread of communism is something that occurred pretty much simultaneously after the end of World War II. And unfortunately for the European powers that had previously controlled a lot of these colonies that were now newly independent nations, that made them very susceptible targets to communism. Or at least in their minds it did. Iran, as an example of this, was one of those nations that for effectively a century had been under the influence of the British, to say the least. But then back during World War II, what the British and the Soviets did is they went and invaded Iran because the head of it at the time was kind of pro-Nazi, and they didn't want a Nazi to take charge in an area that could potentially be a threat to both of them. So they invaded it. And so now, with its new government in power, Iran officially became a member of the Allies instead of going over to the Axis, whether they wanted to or not. But of course, after the war, tensions didn't exactly go away, and many Iranians were still very pissed off at the British and didn't like that the Anglo-Persian company had essentially complete control over Iran's oil reserves. So then, back in the year 1951, Iran's rather popular leader, a man by the name of Mo Mohammad Mossadegh then went and moved to nationalize Iran's oil supply, something that would have driven the British completely out, and this is not something that they wanted. So the British go and appeal to the United States for help, and the United States naturally goes and helps the British. And so the two nations get together and organize a coup to remove Mossadegh from power and actually return the Shah, the former royal head of Iran, back into power who would be very authoritarian, but simultaneously at the same time would be very pro-Western. Now, the thing about this intervention is that it worked. It actually worked. The Western powers got what they wanted, and simultaneously Iran had a authoritarian, but still more progressively minded Western-styled ruler, someone who was going to modernize Iran socially. The problem becomes that these reforms and this leader really pissed off a lot of the more conservative-minded elements of the country, who around 30 years later would then take over the country in a revolution that would give us the oil crisis, the hostage crisis, and also at the same time create a hostile entity in Central Asia, which to this day still has a very anti-American, very anti-Western outlook. What you can see behind me here is actually one of the uh, Iranian propaganda videos that they have right here. It's um very anti-American. So after World War II, a lot of the more impoverished nations in Latin America proved to be perfect breeding grounds for communist dissent, with the reason for this being that at the time there were a lot of low-income peasants who were essentially getting abused by either wealthy landowners or Western-backed companies. It wasn't exactly a pretty picture. And in the meantime, in all of this, in 1954, the Red Scare was in full swing in the United States, a country which had just finished fighting in the Korean War, and so wariness of communism and communist sympathizers was pretty much at an all-time high at this point. And so it is into all of this that we would see Guatemala, a small Latin American country go and elect Jacobo Arbenz. And one of the things that he was doing was allowing communists to have a seat in government. Now, although the fact that these communists were in government was bad to the Americans, it wasn't necessarily the end of the world. What irked them further was the fact that he was passing a series of land reforms. You see, a lot of the best agricultural land in Guatemala was something that was owned by U.S. fruit companies. But the ironic part about all of this is that the majority of that was something that was unused. Like, they just weren't doing anything with it. So what Arbenz then wanted to do was to buy a lot of this unused unused land and then redistribute it to the peasants, people who would then be able to become farmers and develop and prosper themselves. So they weren't just going to steal it, they were going to pay for it. The problem comes in this case is that the monetary amount that was offered for the land was $1.2 million, which is a really low amount, but that is the exact amount that the fruit company was putting on their tax forms as the value of their land. Hint, hint, the reason why the company lowballed the amount that their land was actually worth for so long was simply because they were trying to avoid paying tax 
taxes. So when the exact amount that they said it was worth was offered, they instead said, no, 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 it's actually worth $16 million. That's what you have to pay us. But that wasn't gonna happen at this point. So since they couldn't get the money that they wanted, the fruit company then responded by framing our Benz as a communist and communist sympathizer. And the US would then follow by authorizing a coup to occur against him and proceeded to back rebel groups, which would then go over and take over the country. So in May of 1954, a CIA backed rebel group would attack the capital and Arbenza's government, who feared that at this point, we're going to have a direct US military intervention with actual troops on the ground said, nope, nope, we, we don't want that. And then they forced Arbenz to resign. Carlos Castillas Amas was then installed as dictator in a move that was very, very heavily criticized by pretty much everyone on earth at that point. This was a move that was so brazen that it essentially pissed off every single Latin American group that you could possibly have and would stir anti-Western feelings for decades, even to this day. The really ironic part is, is that the CIA genuinely believed that the Soviet Union was trying to influence or control the country of Guatemala, so they launched an operation called PB History in order to prove via documentation that the Soviet Union was controlling Guatemala, you know, in an effort to justify what it is that they did. No evidence ever came up and the entire thing was a failure. Thus, America had no real way that they could justify to the international community what it is that they had done. What would follow is that Castillo would then go and ban any opposition parties, he would torture political prisoners, he would, he would basically do all the bad things that you would expect of a dictator to do. But it didn't really matter because it stopped the social reforms that had brought the intervention in the first place. And for nearly four decades, what would follow that would be civil war, with hundreds of thousands of people dying and regime after regime fighting these guerrillas. Chaos would reign in Guatemala for a long time. Prior to the year 1915, Haiti was effectively in a state of utter chaos. This being because between the years 1911 and 1915, there were no less than seven presidents of Haiti, with the different ones either being assassinated or ousted from power, depending on, you know, who it was. No big deal, it just happens. And all of this tension, all of this chaos, everything was happening in this country was really scaring the United States, which thought, okay, well, what if a foreign power like Germany, which was getting a big presence in the area, might come in and take things over, and then we're gonna have a European power literally on our doorstep. And that wasn't an idea that they liked. Which brings us to the first part of this intervention because it occurred in two parts. The first part being that back in the year 1914, the Wilson administration of the United States sent US Marines down into Haiti in order to quell things. While there, they removed $500,000 from the Haitian National Bank and put it in a bank in New York, which effectively gave the United States control of the Haitian National Bank. Whoopsie, unintended consequences, you know. But then things would get significant significantly worse because in the year 1915, the president of Haiti would once again get assassinated. And so of course, Haiti then falls into an even greater state of chaos. And so in response, what would happen is that President Wilson would once again send the US Marines into Haiti, this time with the express purpose of preventing anarchy, though in reality, what would happen here is that they were meant to protect US assets and interests and also so that another power, like Germany, couldn't just step in and take things over. But then the end result of that is that the United States just takes over. Yeah, you know, these are the arguments you make. Thus, what ended up happening is that Haiti became a occupied US client state for effectively 19 years. During that time, they would stabilize the country to be sure, but also at the same time, there were a series of uh, rather negative effects as a result of this. You see, we're talking about the 19 teens and 1920s, an era in which the Jim Crow mentality in the United States is in full swing. And as a result of that, even even in a African dominated state like Haiti, ideas of segregation is something that would worm its way into the government, which in turn would create a lot of tension between lighter skinned people in Haiti and darker skinned people in Haiti, even if they were both African. The bigger problem though, was that the US military, despite claiming to be a modernizing force at the same time was something that severely weakened Haiti's institutions. Essentially anything that the US government wanted passed would get passed. It was a puppet government that was in charge of Haiti and they were going to do whatever they had to. And one of the other consequences of this is that the US would invest very heavily in the capital city of Port-au-Prince, while simultaneously letting the rest of the country kind of not fall into ruin exactly, that's not the right word, but uh, be neglected, that, that's more accurate. Any power within Haiti was concentrated within the government in the capital city. There really wasn't anything that any kind of outside force within the country could have done. Haiti's provinces became weaker and the executive position within Haiti became significantly stronger, which mind you, under a good government is not a bad thing. The problem is governments have a tendency to not act very good Good. This whole centralized system then became a massive liability when in 1957, the guy that they elected to power was Francois de Volière. You see, de Volière as a guy
guy was a black nationalist. He was a person who had found a lot of support in Haiti by mobilizing a lot of the racial animosities between people against the United States, particularly after the intervention from 20, 30 years earlier. The man basically had no kind of respect whatsoever for any democratic process and would instead use a very violent paramilitary force to crush any political opponents or dissidents against his regime. Within only a few years, he would have a dictatorship, one that was uh, more of a kleptocracy as it was something that he would use in order to steal a lot of Haiti's wealth and watch it fall into economic, political, and social decline and ruin. After his death in 1971, his son Jean would then take over as president for life. In other words, a dictator. He, he was also a dictator. Now this younger leader, this new Duvalier, is someone who would portray himself as a modernizer, but he didn't really do all that much and a lot of his promises were hollow. Though the Duvalier family would eventually be ousted from power in the 80s, the reality was is that Haiti never really recovered. So ends the story of another American intervention that eventually went wrong. But everyone, this has been Sakuyi with the history of everything. I hope that you really enjoyed today's episode. I simultaneously really hope that you enjoyed this new format that I'm trying here. I really want to switch up the style of what it is that I'm doing uh, to, to help things along. So if you like this, if you want to see more like this, let me know. If you want me to go more back into the pictures and just like full videos and everything, also let me know. I might pull it out a poll to determine what kind of style I'm going to stick with in the future, but I want it to be fun. So anyway, thank you all very much. Thank you for supporting this channel. Check out Patreon, check out my coffee, check out everything you can in the links in my description, and I hope that you have a good rest of your day. Thank you everyone, and goodbye.